Oh yeah, it's recording. Sounds good. Perfect, thank you. Alrighty, well, welcome everyone. Um, good on you for waking up so early on a weekend. Um, so today, what? So my name is Nam. Firstly, a uh, final year medical student. Um, so what we'll be doing today, I'll be covering today, is gastro and renal, and then. Basically, gastro has two components. So there's the non-surgical and there's also the surgical side. And I'll just be covering the non-surgical side. And then I think Ben Amberg's going to be covering the surgical side of um, gastro and peds. Okay. So firstly, gastro. Um, in terms of what I'll be covering, the main things you guys need to know about is gourd, gastroenteritis, and a bit on celiac disease. The others just know them briefly and they're all part of your matrix though. Uh, yeah, okay. So we'll start off with a question. So you guys can just type it in the chat and then I'll just have a look at what everyone's thinking. Um, in terms of questions, feel free to type them in the chat as well, but I'll have a look at them a bit later on just for the sake of time. Yeah, that's good. Perfect. So you guys are thinking no investigations required. Yeah, so this is basically a typical um, stem that you'll get for gore. And um, we'll go through why there's no investigations required for this. Ah, there we go. Okay, um, so gore is pretty much a normal sort of thing. Um, and it's very common in young kids, especially um, babies, and it self-resolves by when they're one years old. And this is basically due to an issue in their lower esophageal sphincter, which self-resolves as they grow and it tightens. And gore, of course, is the gastric contents going into the esophagus. Then you have, um, I've lost my mouse. Okay, then you have gourd. So this is a pathological thing, just like in adults, it's the same. The reason why we worry about it in kids is mainly because of esophagitis, from all the gastric contents, failure to thrive, and also aspiration, which they're at risk of, especially when lying down. Um, and this issue does need treatment. Um, we often start with a conservative approach and then go to medications and then surgeries. So, um, this is more prevalent in certain children, especially um, children with developmental issues such as cerebral palsy and Down syndrome. And the clinical findings are exactly what you've learned in third year, which is just vomiting and that regurgitation. Um, but to emphasize that's non-bilious. If it's bilious, then you're, then you're thinking another cause um, more along the sides of PED surge. You also get um, some irritability and this, they don't want to eat. And then you also get failure to thrive because of them not wanting to eat, but also because they're regurgitating most of the things that they do eat. Um, and then the complications that I've mentioned before. So in terms of investigations, as I said, not really relevant, but um, I'll just put these in for completion. Um, in terms of management, so pretty much all of PEDS, the way you manage kids is you take a conservative approach first, um, where you want to manage them non-medically as possible, and then you go into medicine when that fails, and then you go into surgery if, um, if it still remains unresolved. So the non-medical approach for Gord is pretty much... Um, it makes sense. So you sit them upright after food, you burp them after food, you ask the parents to give them smaller meals, but more frequently, and adding, adding thickener to the formula so they don't regurgitate it and it's less likely to regurgitate. Another thing to rule out is milk protein allergy, and I'll talk about that briefly a bit later. In terms of medications, it's pretty much the same as adults. So PPIs and ranitidine, but in children, we prefer ranitidine first and, and then move on to PPIs if that doesn't work. Surgery is Nissen fund application, which you guys may have heard of. That's where you can sort of use the stomach muscle as, um, and you staple it around the esophagus to bulk up the tone of the 
lower esophageals, think there. Yeah, and so throughout my slide, you'll see this orange box. And if anything you wanna take away from, to, from my lecture, pretty much just learn this orange box and you'll be good. So um, next one is gastroenteritis. So this is a really long topic and kind of the bane of my existence, but um, I've tried to summarize it as much as possible and have it as buzzwordy as possible. So risk factors, um, self-explanatory. Then you have um, the clinical findings. So same as in adults, you get diarrhea, vomiting, abdo pain, and systemic features. Um, things that are different in peds is they you get crying because that's how kids reflect pain. And you also get that refusal to eat and drink, which leads to dehydration. Also dehydration from increased output. And that is a common cause of death in kids because of the fact that they already have such low volumes. And so if they're excreting more, they um, can quickly deteriorate. Um, another feature to peds is the febrile convulsions. So if they're febrile, they can get convulsions. Red flags to look for is pretty much diarrhea that lasts longer than 10 days, especially due to the complications of dehydration. A bilious vomit, as I've said, usually reflects more of a pediatric surge issue um, and some others. So this is the microbiome slide, um, the dreaded slide. So rotavirus is common, C. jejuni is common. Rotavirus is that one that you'll see in the exams as like the kindergarten teacher or daycare or kids going to daycare getting gastro and you suspect that. C. jejuni is um, food poisoning. So the three main causes of gastro are viral, bacteria and parasites. Bacteria, I've mentioned dysentery here. This is the one that causes blood and pus in your um, stools. And that uses the acronym CHESS. And so these are the things under CHESS. Um, some other things, C. diff is like post-antibiotics and then you use metronidazole. Um, e. coli is traveler's diarrhea. And then you have Giardia and Entamoeba, which are those parasites, which cause weird and wonderful smelling stools. Um, I've also listed some antibiotics, so you guys can just have a read through it later in your own time. So some differentials. So if you want to make a diagnosis of gastro, you also want to rule out sinister causes like the acute abdomen, um, which I think Ben Ambrick will be covering. And you also want to rule out stuff like the UTI, the appendicitis, DKA, or any other sorts of infections. Yeah, so investigations, not really relevant here again. It's a clinical diagnosis. If they have, a, if they have diarrhea and those other features, then you suspect gastro but you want to monitor for complications. So you look at electrolytes, you look at glucose, and you can do a stool MCS, and that can tell you what type of organism might be causing it. Um, if they're very unwell, then of course you'll do a sepsis screen. So the main management around gastroenteritis is, a, is oral rehydration therapy or just rehydration therapy in general. So that can be orally or by NG tube or IV. And the principle is you want to use gastrolyte, hydrolyte, plasmolyte, all those electrolyte drinks. Um, and you want to encourage the parents to continue breastfeed if they're still breastfeeding. And you want to avoid things like lemonade and sports drinks and stop feed fortifications because you don't want that thickened feeds and rather give them more fluids. There's also some other ones which you use sparingly in kids, such as on dance control and if they're vomiting. You can't use them in kids younger than six months. Antidiarrheals like lepiramide and also antibiotics, um, which I mentioned before in micro, in the microbiome can be used depending on the organism and are often used in like overseas travelers, immunocompromised kids, and if they have dysentery. I would highly recommend checking ETG out if you guys want to learn the antibiotics. I think it's relevant as well in the GP part of it which also has gastroenteritis. So worth checking out there. And once again, these are your buzzwords pretty much. If you remember these, you should be all right. So here's another question.
Yeah, so metabolic acidosis. Um, do you got, um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory here. Um, pretty much how it works is that when they vomit, they let go of acid, so they're actually getting a metabolic alkalosis, but then they also have diarrhea, which causes a more of a metabolic acidosis, and so they kind of cancel out, but the dehydration can also cause a mild AKI, which ends up probably being metabolic acidosis. Yeah, and this was a um, past year question and which they released the answers. So I'm just gonna briefly go over dehydration, um, something that's actually you guys should know well, that's probably the highest yield slide here. Um, so symptoms of that is lethargy and irritability in kids, especially younger kids who can't actually reflect to you that they are dehydrated um, and they basically become drowsy. In terms of signs you look for is input and output. So input is the feeds, which the parents can tell you. And then the output is like stuff like wherever they can output from. So urine, diarrhea, and vomiting. You can also assess them with like CRT and skin turgor and all these things. So CRT, you're looking for a CRT less than two seconds, which you can do by pressing on the sternum. Um, and this table here is pretty much the level of dehydration. And we'll go through a case study later and you can see why it's relevant. So when you have moderate rehydration, you get a slightly increased CRT and pretty much everything else remains the same. And then in more severe dehydration, you start to get all these other changes like deep acidotic breathing and changes in your vital signs. Fontanelles are unique obviously to babies. Um, and so you can look at the sunken as well. Yeah, and this is basically now a slide on fluids. So the way you approach fluids is firstly resuscitation. You give them a fluid bolus and that is 10 to 20 mils per kilo. Then you have the, your fluid maintenance therapy to remain hydration. Um, and so there's three components to it. The first one is their daily fluid maintenance. So 150, 20 is what I use, or you can use 421. And that's basically, I hope you guys are familiar with this one. So it's like, imagine you have a, a 25 kilo baby, the first 10 kilos will be 100 mils per kilo, then the next 10 will be 50 mils per kilo, then five kilos will be 20 mils per kilo. And that's the daily rate. Four to one uses the same principle, but it's an hourly rate. Um, another thing to note is that if they're very unwell children, use two thirds of whatever the rate you come up with for maintenance. Then the next bit is the deficit in liters. So this was that percentage dehydration that I showed you in the table. You basically times that by their weight and you get how much fluid they should be getting every hour or every day as well. Then you have ongoing losses. This is basically if they're having more diarrhea or if they're having more vomiting, you want to replenish those as well. Yeah, and once again, avoiding lemonade, fortified foods, and using stuff like hydrolyte and plasmolite. And so I've pretty much summarized that in this little orange bubble. Um, I pretty much pasted that all throughout my notes wherever fluids was an issue, and that helped me remember it. So this is a quick case study. So Peter is a 22 kg boy, came in with vomiting and diarrhea. He vomited out 100 mils before coming in, in the last two hours. He appears to have increased respirate and mildly delayed CRT. So let's say he has a percent of dehydration of 6%. Please write up his fluids for Peter. I'll just give you guys a moment to think about it and then we can go through it. Yeah, so uh, Nam, I think you've accidentally muted yourself. Perfect. Can you hear me? Is that yeah, no. okay? Awesome. Um, okay, so I I hope I wasn't muted before. Um, okay, so this is. So this is a 22 kg boy. So you give 20 mils per kilo. So the bolus would be 440 mils. 
then you want to replace the deficit. So we said he was 6% dehydrated. You times that by 22, and that gives you your daily rate of um, hydration. Then you have maintenance fluid. So you can use 421 or 150 um, 20 for this, and then you get an hourly or daily rate. And then lastly, you have ongoing losses. So if he lost um, 100 mils over two hours, you replenish it in such a way. So you replenish 50 mils per hour over two hours. And if you add all these up, you end up getting a rate of what fluids should be running at for him. So for the first two hours, they'll be slightly higher. And then after the ongoing losses were replaced, it'll get lower. I hope that makes sense. Um, feel free to have a look at it in your own time as well, or you can message me later. So another question. So this is a mum who brings in her three month old baby to ED with small amounts of blood in the nappy and an itchy rash. They've just started solids. Yeah, so the answer is D. Um, we did get some confusion about celiac disease and that's fair enough because it does um, have a similar sort of uh, clinical picture. But I guess the thing here is that um, cow milk protein usually um, presents around three months old when they're first being introduced to solids and their solids are usually cow's milk and formula milk. Um, and then, yeah, you get those atrophy symptoms and you also get that blood in the nappy with an itchy rash being the buzzword here as well. And I'll also go through it a bit. So this is a great differential for gastroenteritis. So you can mention in your OSCEs if gastro is a stem. Um, and this presents when you transition into formula, causing that eczema and that bloody diarrhea. And you get this rash as well that's quite itchy. The way you manage it is with Neocate, which is basically a prescription baby formula. It's very, very expensive. It's around like $40 a can, so it can be very expensive for parents. Um, so it's important to reassess if the child still has that allergy because it often resolves in two to four years. And then they can go back onto cow's milk again. Yeah, and then on the other hand, this is celiac disease. So celiac disease is that autoimmune response to gluten, such as wheat, rye, and barley. And this usually happens a bit later on, so six to eight months. Um, and it's associated with stuff like diabetes and thyroid disease. And you also have some of these other ones as well. In terms of the findings for celiac, it's more, the baby looks more like this, where they get wasting of their buttocks and their shoulders, and then they get this bloating of the stomach. They also get a rash that's called dermatitis herpetiformis, which is more of a rash on the shins. And then, um, of course, when you have that malabsorption in your small intestine, you also will get failure to thrive and vitamin deficiencies. So iron B12 folate, um, it's absorbed in the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. If you guys know the mnemonic of I, F, K, Beaches. That pretty much works. I don't know if I could say that in the recording, but yep. Um, so, duodenum, jejunum, ileum, and that's why celiac disease gets those deficiencies. You also get vitamin A, D, E, K, and those are basically fat, fat soluble vitamins. So, when you get that dysfunction in your small gut, then you get malabsorption. In terms of investigations, so the main ones I want you guys to know is antibodies. So these are, I guess, exam relevant. So anti-TTG, anti-endomycel, and anti and other antibodies. And the gold standard is a small bowel biopsy. So you do one when they're on the gluten diet, then you do one 12 months after they've stopped gluten. 
And if you guys remember your dreaded pathology from third year, you get lymphocytes, blunting of your villi, and crypt hyperplasia. Managing is very simple. Gluten-free diet, review with the dietitian of what they can eat and supplement their vitamins when they have the active disease or the deficient of those vitamins. Yeah. And once again, just you can read that and that pretty much summarizes all you need to know. I would highly recommend also the Muppets um, sheet, summary sheet for this, because um, I'm a bit of a visual learner, so this was presented quite nicely. Um, and they have sheets on all the conditions, so definitely have a look at those. So we'll move on to the next question. So four-year-old boy presents with generalized abdominal pain. Three weeks ago, he passed the painful stool and the urinalysis is normal. Yeah, yeah, so the answer is B, so it's constipation. I assume you guys are on the ball with this since everyone got it right. Um, I'll explain why this is constipation next. Um, so once again, definitely would refer the constipation and encochoresis Muppet summary sheet for this. It was pretty good. Um, so constipation firstly, what's normal in kids? Firstly, kids tend to defecate or poop every two to three days and breastfeeding babies can take even longer to poop. So they can poop around once a week. So that's normal. Outside of that would then be abnormal. So functional constipation is another thing. So this is basically when young children resist that urge to poop and that leads to the stools to harden, which then become painful to pass. And then they associate that pain with pooping so they don't poop and then you get reluctance and then you get retention and that's how you end up with constipation so the child above pretty much he had a painful movement three weeks ago and then now he stopped pooping and that's why he's now gone into constipation and hence why is that generalized abdominal pain and urinalysis was done to rule out if it's a uti yeah, and then you also have the Rome criteria of um, diagnosing functional constipation. However, there are other causes of constipation as well. So for infants, you also want to look at calma protein intolerance, as well as metabolic causes, and also the surgical causes, which we'll cover later today. Then in children, you have functional constipation because they can refuse to poop. And then you also have the metabolic stuff as well as developmental issues and celiac disease. Next is um, pretty much your approach to constipation. So you have your history exam talking about their stools, their behaviors, um, if there's any blood or if it's painful to pass the stools. And then on examination, you wanna look down there for any neurological issues. Um, or any anatomical deformities that might be leading to this, or if they have any, if they have an anal fissure that's painful, and then you can. Kids are generally skinny, so you can often palpate the fecal mass there as well to see if they have fecal impaction or fecal overload. In terms of investigation, once again, not really needed. However, I put them in for completion, so you could do an abdominal X-ray, looking for more sinister causes, looking for small bowel obstruction. Um, and then also looking for if there's any underlying causes for their constipation. In terms of management, so once again, the same principles. We go conservative management, then medical management if we can't get on top of that. So you want to um, work around their behavior. So positioning is important. So their legs should be up on a stool, their elbows to their knees, and that helps to open up um, the sphincter so they can poop easier, as well as um, positively reinforcing them and rewarding them for going to the toilet every day. Um, and you also want to fix diet if that's an issue. So less takeout and more fiber and more, hyd more hydration. In terms of medication, so if that doesn't work, you go into medications. 
um, which aim to go for one soft, easy to pass bowel movement every day. So you start off with oral medications. So um, oral medications differ for neonates, infants, and children. So these medications, they have to be on it for a few months to a year. So that's important to inform the patient, um, pa the parents about that. So neonates use colloxal drops. Infants use like Movicol sachets. And then children, you can use those as well as lubricants. In terms of um, um, if that fails or they're in a lot of, if they're fecal impaction, then you want to go into a more PR approach, which the kids won't like. So you can use a fleet enema or glycerin suppositories, or you can do a bowel washout. If they have an anal fissure, you can use Vaseline jelly and steroid cream can also play a role. Um, no, this isn't a buzzword box. So this is pretty much about the red flags you wanna look out for. So if they have rhythm like poop, then it could be an anal sphincter and that um, problem, like the, it could be an anatomical issue, or if they have like failure to thrive, um, you want to look out for that and then treat the constipation um, quickly. Um, also, delay in meconium and stuff can be more of a surgical issue as well. Then you have, following on from constipation, encoparesis, which is basically um, like bedwetting, but they're pooping themselves. So this could be for a variety of reasons, such as like ADHD or opposition-defined disorder or neurological stuff like spina bifida. However, the most common cause is usually due to chronic constipation where um, you get this overflow incontinence. Yeah, um, and then lastly, IBD. I've just put the same for completion cuts in your matrix, but I'm assuming you guys are all familiar with it. Important to know the clinical presentation, differentiating between Crohn's and UC as well as management. So immunosuppressants like steroids, methotrexate, azathioprine, and then surgery is like resection of bowel. Yeah, and that was for gastro. Um, I'm just having a look if there's any questions. Okay, so I'll go into um, renal. Um, so the main things to know with renal is pretty much UTI um, and briefly knowing about nephrotic syndrome and aneurysis. And then, then there's all these other things like inguinoscrotal swellings and penis foreskin and all that stuff. But I've just put that in later in tables so you guys can read. So here's a question. Yeah, great. So this is um, VUR. So that's just refluxing. And that's basically refluxing into your ureters and kidney. I'll explain why that's the case um, in the next slides. So basically, let's go through UTI first. So this is very similar to your approach to a febrile child, which is going to be covered later on today. Um, and with E. coli being the most common bacteria. Um, in terms of it's different for neonates, infants, and children. So E. coli in neonates, and that's pretty much sepsis, so urosepsis. In infants, there's a few more bugs, and you pretty much get the same symptoms, and they also can draw up their legs. In terms of children, it's pretty much the same bugs, and you just get more symptoms, such as dysuria and um, pain, which then they can portray and reflect to you. In adolescents, it's pretty much the same as adults, and you just consider a sexual history as well. So in terms of investigations you would do, so urine sample is probably your main gold standard thing, um, and urine MCS is what you want to do. So 
this is a an extra thing which they talk about in terms of collecting a urine sample. In adults, it's easy. You ask them to do a midstream urine and you'll get that. In children, it's not that easy. So some of your options are you can collect in a bag and then sample that urine. However, this is usually um, not as sterile, so you can grow cultures and that would be an inappropriate test. So what you want to do is if they're toilet trained, ask them to get a midstream urine test. However, otherwise you can do a clean catch. So in this picture, this is what a clean catch is. You clean around the area, then you rub on their suprapubic area and that stimulates them to pee. And then you pretty much hold a jar and try to collect the urine. Yeah, and it's very messy. In terms of um, if it's urgent or clean catch doesn't work, you can do a suprapubic aspirate. So that's a needle through the suprapubic area or an in-out catheter, where you put a catheter in, click some urine, and then take it out. Um, and another investigation that's relevant is a renal ultrasound. So this is more looking towards if it's VUR or there's other obstructions. And this is done in unwell children or those that are unresponsive to therapy, or if they've had recurrent UTIs, similar to the girl in the stem, who's been having recurrent UTIs, and then um, you do a renal ultrasound to see hydronephrosis. If, you, if they're very unwell and you're suspecting urosepsis, then you do a septic screen. In terms of management, so antibiotics are your mainstay management for a UTI. So you go for trimethoprene and sulfurs unless they're less than six months in which you don't use sulfurs. Um, if they're very unwell, then you're going to go for your urosepsis management, so IV, Ben Pen, and Gen. And lastly, you want to follow up children, um, certain children, with a pediatrician. So those that were very unwell, boys that were that like less than three months, and also those that you found had a renal tract abnormality, such as VUR. Um, so moving on to VUR then. So this is pretty much, as I said, a dysfunction where you get reflux of urine into your ureters and your kidney. Um, and so in terms of pathophysiology, so you can have an anatomical cause or a physiological cause. So this is something that gets mentioned, posterior urethral valves. So this is when you have a blockage distally in your urethra, so past the bladder in your urethra. And that causes pressure to build up in your bladder and that causes reflux into your ureters and your kidneys. You also have um, this one, which you guys can read. And then you have physio physiological stuff, such as um, neurogenic causes or behavioral stuff where they hold their pee in. Um, so approach to VUR, the way you find it is pretty much, um, it would be a finding on renal ultrasound. Um, and then you see the hydronephrosis and that's how you come to your diagnosis. Um, and other things in terms of diagnosing VUR, you could also pick it up in terms of other complications, such as they've been having recurrent UTIs and that then reflects that they might have reflux as well. Um, reflux is bad because having reflux causes scarring of your kidneys which then can lead to um, renal disease later on. Um, and if they get renal disease, they're also at risk of hypertension. You can also get some bowel and bladder dysfunction as well. So in terms of investigations for VUR, so each of these investigations makes sense in terms of physiology. So if they get hypertension from kidney disease, then they'll get an elevated blood pressure. You also want to do a urine MCS to check for UTIs and also if they have protein urea. You'll also look at um, their renal function to see if that's dropped off, reflecting that there might be some scarring or there might be some AKI. Then you have these special tests. So you have your renal ultrasound, which is hydronephrosis and can show scarring. The buzzword here that's been used before is a lock and key on renal ultrasound and that reflects posterior urethral valves. You can also get um, some of these other scans, 
I'll just go through them very quickly. So M M C U is basically fill up the bladder and would die, and then you see how if, if it's refluxing when they pee. Then you have a DMSA scan, so you put dye in through a vein and see where that dye goes and how they pee it out. Or you can directly visualize it with a cystoscopy. In terms of management, so VUR, it pretty much self-resolves in young children. However, you want to manage the complication. So the main complication is about UTIs and managing those. So you can put them on prophylactic antibiotics. Or if that reflux doesn't resolve, then you have to go towards surgery. So that could be an injection into the bladder or implanting the ureters at such an angle that doesn't reflux. Yeah, so here's another question. Yep, great. So this is um, minimal change disease. Um, I think this is pretty straightforward. Basically, vital signs are normal, so unaffected, but they're just a bit puffy. So you and they have increased protein. So that pretty much means they have nephrotic syndrome, and they're probably a minimal change disease. So oh, um, very quickly in terms of nephrotic syndrome. Um, Basically, nephrotic syndrome, you guys are familiar with and probably have learned in third year as part of glomerulonephritis. So you get the same symptoms such as um, hypoalbuminemia, um, that word, and hyperlipidemia, protein, urea, edema, and all that stuff. Um, but in children, you also want to be uh, cautious of the complications. So once again, hypervolemia. This is because they're third spacing and they're getting edematous. However, that means they're losing volume. Um, so you want to assess their hydration status. Then you also have edema. So the edema can lead to infection because that's a breeding ground for bugs. So if you have, if it's in your lungs, you get shortness of breath and you can get infections. If you have it in your abdomen, so that's ascites, you can get bacterial peritonitis. If it's in your legs, you can get cellulitis. And if it's in your genitals, it will probably cause them a lot of discomfort. And they're also at risk of thrombosis from this as well. So in terms of investigations, not a lot there. It's the same thing that I've been repeating. Um, it's about testing their urine, looking at their renal function, looking at their protein creatinine ratio, and CRP is to check for inflammation, which is, might be causing the nephrotic syndrome. In terms of management then, I use the mnemonic OPRA. So this pretty much is managing all the complications that I've mentioned here. So in order to manage the edema, you want to do daily weights, fluid balance, salt and water restrictions. Um, however, if it's severe and you need to get rid of that edema quickly, then you use IV albumin and prusamide. Then you have your prophylactic. So that's to avoid the infection, you put them on an antibiotic until the edema resolves and the antibiotic is penicillin-5. You also use prednisolone to reduce that inflammation that might be causing the nephrotic syndrome and that you put them on for four weeks and then you wean them down um, over the next two months. Because you're giving steroids, you also want to give ranitidine because steroids can cause gastritis. And lastly is um, aspirin. So aspirin is because they're at risk of thrombosis, so you give them aspirin while they have nephrotic syndrome. Um, then lastly, you have help family. And this is just about that a third can go into remission, a third will relapse, and a third will infrequently relapse. And once again, this is the buzzwords. You pretty much just need to know this for nephrotic syndrome. You should be good. So here's another question about the management.
Yeah, so this is A. Um, so this child is puffy and has proteinuria to suspecting um, a nephrotic syndrome. However, if you look at the capillary refill, that's less than two seconds. So if you remember that table about dehydration, that means they're probably only mildly dehydrated and they're normotensive. That means they're probably not hypovolemic as well. So because it's not severe nephrotic syndrome, you avoid um, albumin and furosemide, and you would give them steroids still. You would um, admit them and you'd also put them on a strict fluid balance as well as daily weights. Um, the next one. So it's a seven year old girl who presents with one episode of frank hematuria. Yeah, perfect, great. So this is IgA nephropathy. Um, I guess another thing you could think if it's post-strip glomerulonephritis. Um, the reason it's IgA is because of the acuter onset and also the fact that it affects renal function. If it was post-strip, it's less likely to have affected their renal function and it usually occurs around 10 days post inerty. Um, and I just put this in because for completion and this is nephritic syndrome. Here's another one. Yeah, great, Trent. So this is um, aneuresis. Um, and that's because she's been bedwetting for the past two months and there's no other real reason behind it since they've done a dipstick and ruled out UTI. Um, and it's probably a more of a behavioral thing as they've just moved schools and she isn't adjusting well. So aneuresis is just bedwetting. You can also get diurnal aneuresis. So this is during the daytime. An important th differentiation in terms of bedwetting is the non monosymptomatic. So this is when you have other lower urinary tract symptoms, and that pretty much then needs to be looked at further. So the approach you take is learning about the habits, doing the same examination of the renal of the um, of their renal, doing a renal exam, and then lastly investigations of your urinalysis. In terms of management, so it's important to reassure parents that this will resolve by itself when they're six by six. And if it doesn't, then you can use stuff like the pad and bell alarm. So this is when they wet the bed, an alarm goes off, then they change their sheets, and then they go back to sleep. And you want to use positive reinforcement to reward that behavior. In the short term, you can also use desmopressin because it can be quite embarrassing, especially if they're going to a sleepover school camp. Um, and that helps reduce the likelihood of them wetting the bed. You refer to peds if it's an ongoing issue or if they have any of these diurnal or secondary aneurysis. And these are the buzzwords for this. Perfect. And so that's pretty much all. Um, I've just got some other content here that you guys can have a look at, such as failure to thrive. Oh, the slide. Um, so failure to thrive and then, oh my gosh. Um, and then you have acute scrotum, inguinoscrotal swellings, and then just some other questions you guys can go through. And then there's pe stuff on penis and foreskin as well. So just feel free to have a look at this in your own time, guys. And these were my references. And thanks, guys, for listening. I sorry don't have enough time for questions but i i think muppets is compiling a list or they've been answering it during the chat great thanks guys thanks so much nam that was great i learned heaps i'm sure the fourth years did um yeah so i've been compiling the questions into a document and answering some in the chat as well so we'll we will release them to everyone at the end of the event um just so everyone can learn from everyone's questions um so thanks nam next up we have ben Perfect. um
He is presenting on pediatric surgery. I think he's here. I think I saw him. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. Um, so you can just share your slides and start whenever you're ready. Thanks, Ben. Amazing. This is going. Also, Ben, if you could record locally on your computer, um, uh, we can mostly just use uh, your recording because it's typically more stable. So that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Not only know. Um, uh, let me Next. start the recording. Hold on. Please request local permission.